This is the second dry lab module for the Intro Synthetic Biology online series from CSBIRT. The topic of this model is module is deterministic modeling of genetic circuits. This is part one of four. This module is broken into four parts because each of the related modules, I believe, require their own introductions before we can start in with the more technical material that we delivered in the format of chalk talk with uh, Jupyter Notebooks. The references for all four of the modules include Brian Engel's textbook, chapters 2, 3, and 7. If you'd like a copy of Brian Engel's textbook, I refer you to the references slide of module 1, where I've included a link to download a free PDF. In part 3, I'll reference Gardner et al., published in Nature in 2000. This introduces the so-called Collins toggle switch. And in part 4, where I give some motivations for stochastic modeling in biology, I will reference Elowitz et al. published in Science in 2002. And a more advanced textbook reference, which is purely supplemental if you're interested, is the following. An Introduction to Systems Biology, Design Principles of Biological Circuits, and this is by Yuri Howard. Part one of this second module is going to give an overview of the central dogma of molecular biology, and then we'll discuss modeling unregulated gene expression. Part two is going to look at modeling regulated gene expression with a focus on transcription factors, which is a specific mode of genetic regulation. Then part three, we'll look at an example of a synthetic gene circuit, particularly the Collins toggle switch. In looking at this, we'll do a phase plane analysis, a bifurcation analysis, and discuss how this is a great example of model guided experimentation. And finally, part four, even though this is a session on deterministic modeling of gene circuits, I'll start motivating uh, stochastic modeling of gene circuits, and that'll transition us nicely into module three, for which that is the topic. Okay, let's get started with the central dogma. This is a principle which describes the flow of information amongst biopolymers that are ubiquitous across all forms of life. This includes deoxyribonucleic acid, or DNA, ribonucleic acid, or RNA, and polypeptides, which are amino acid polymers, uh, commonly known as proteins. This principle was first stated by Francis Crick in 1957 and published in 58. It was restated more succinctly, however, in a 1970 Nature paper as follows, and I quote, the central dogma of molecular biology deals with the detailed residue by residue transfer of sequential information. It states that information cannot be transferred back from protein to either protein or nucleic acid. And that's from Francis Crick. A particular aspect of the central dogma, which we are interested in here, is the process of gene expression. And gene expression can be depicted as it is in this figure, where we see that DNA is being transcribed by RNA polymerase to produce strands of RNA. The RNA polymerase is a protein. Then the strand of RNA is translated by the ribosome to result in protein, the ribosome being a large complex of protein subunits. This two-step process by which DNA is transcribed to RNA and then translated to protein is what we refer to as gene expression. But I do want to point out that the central dogma refers to sequence information flow in biology more generally, and this is a more general figure which shows um, the various pathways that uh, sequential information flow can, can follow in biological systems. We can't do everything. Um, and gene expression is an important phenomenon, and especially in synthetic biology applications, where one might be interested in engineering synthetic gene circuits, which we'll look at um, an example of actually in part three. Okay, so now we'll move on to uh, talking about the technical aspects of modeling unregulated gene expression with our Jupyter Notebook chalk talk. To reduce the number of parameters to reflect the true degree of freedom of parameter space, we non-dimensionalize the equations. This is a common procedure when analyzing dynamical systems, as it reduces the number of parameters that you need to consider when studying your model. The above system of equations is equivalent to the equation I've written here in terms of the indices i and j. Note that we restrict that i doesn't equal j and both can take on values of 1 or 2. I write 
the two equations as just this one expression so as I don't need to perform the same manipulations on two equations. This will make the procedure more clear. And after all, the two equations are identical up to a permutation in their indices. We'll now begin a discussion of deterministic modeling of genetic circuits. We'll start off by discussing unregulated gene expression. Recall the introduction to the central dogma of molecular biology from the slide presentation. Unregulated gene expression refers to the two-step protein synthesis mechanism depicted in the figure below from Brian Ingall's textbook. In particular, it refers to the transcription of the gene or DNA sequence to mRNA, followed by translation of the mRNA resulting in the protein. Also note that each of mRNA and protein are subject to decay. Let lowercase p denote the concentration of a particular protein species and lowercase m denote the concentration of its cognate mRNA transcript. Assume that we are considering a gene that is constitutively expressed. In other words, we suppose that there's no regulatory mechanisms that affect this gene and the cell therefore constantly translates mRNA. Let this constant translation rate be denoted as alpha. Note that alpha has units of concentration per time. We further assume that machinery required for transcription and translation, such as RNA polymerase and ribosomes, are in high abundance and approximately constant. Under these assumptions, the process of translation can be denoted as M goes to P without any other dependencies on reactants. Thus, by max action kinetics, the translation rate will be proportional to the mRNA concentration. Let the constant of proportionality be denoted as gamma. Therefore, the total translation rate in units of concentration per time is gamma times the mRNA concentration. Therefore, the mRNA protein dynamics are given by the following system of coupled ODEs. The first equation gives the derivative of mRNA concentration with respect to time as alpha, the constant rate of translation, transcription, minus d subscript m. And d subscript m, which we will determine later, refers to mRNA decay. The protein dynamics are given by dp by dt equals to gamma m which refers to the rate of transcription, minus d sub p. d sub p is the protein decay, which I will also determine in a moment. There are two main sources of protein decay. First one I'll discuss is dilution. All intracellular concentrations are subject to decay due to cell growth and division. Let us denote the rate of dilution due to cell growth as beta growth. Then we'll take the total rate of dilution of the protein in units of concentration per time as beta growth times the protein concentration. This is sometimes referred to as the dilution approximation, and it's a very common method to model the effect of cellular growth and division on intracellular concentrations. Moreover, it agrees well with explicit, bi explicit binomial splitting models, which is mechanistically what is actually happening with cell growth and div division. But the dilution approximation is analytically less cumbersome, so we'll stick with that. The other source of protein decay is mac macromolecule degradation. This refers to the additional source of decay due to degradation by specialized proteins called proteases. We assume that the concentration of protease in the cell is approximately constant and that it's spatially well mixed. With this assumption, we can take a mass action rate law to describe the action of protein decay by proteases. Taking the constant of proportionality in the rate law to be denoted beta subscript protease, the total rate of protein de de decay due to protease action is equal to beta subscript protease times the protein concentration. Therefore, the total protein decay d subscript p that we had in our original model 
is equal to the rate of dilution plus the rate of protease degradation. And we'll set this equal to beta subscript P times the protein concentration P, where we've defined beta subscript P as the rate of cell growth plus the rate of protease action. Similarly, we can take the total mRNA decay, d sub m, equal to beta sub m times the mRNA concentration m, where similar to beta sub p, beta sub m accounts for both dilution and degradation of the mRNA, and that may take place by the action of other molecular components in the cell. We may now write down the mRNA protein model of constitutive gene expression as is shown here, where we've put in the rate laws for the protein decay and the mRNA decay. Note that this model of gene expression is most applicable to prokaryotic organisms such as bacteria. While translation and transcription proceed similarly in eukaryotic organisms, there are additional steps between such as mRNA splicing and nuclear transport. Of course, these additional steps can be modeled too, but we're not going to focus on that. This is for two reasons, one being for simplicity, which is most appropriate for an introductory course such as this, but moreover, it's fairly relevant to most synthetic biology applications due to the fact that synthetic biology deals primarily with bacterial organisms. And also, I just wanted to point out that this, is, this coupled ODE system that describes constitutive gene expression is exactly the example of a 2D coupled ODE system that I gave in the first module. The only difference is that we've replaced X and Y with N and P. Let's compute the fixed points of this gene expression model. Let's denote the fixed point as M sub SS and P sub SS, SS standing for steady state. To solve for the fixed points, we set both the derivative of mRNA concentration with respect to time evaluated at the steady state and derivative of the protein concentration with respect to time evaluated at the steady state equal to zero. Setting the mRNA derivative equal to zero and evaluating at the steady state, we can algebraically solve for the steady state concentration of mRNA. And we see that is that it turns out to be alpha divided by beta sub m. This makes intuitive sense. As the transcription rate alpha goes up, the steady state mRNA concentration goes up. And as the rate of mRNA concentration reduction or decay increases, the steady state mRNA concentration goes down. Now we can substitute this value for the steady state concentration of mRNA into the steady state equation for protein concentration. And setting the derivative of protein concentration with respect to time evaluated at the steady state equal to zero, we can algebraically solve for the steady state protein concentration in terms of the mRNA steady state concentration. And that's what's shown here on the right, where we have gamma over beta p times m steady state. Then substituting the value of M steady state into that expression, we have an expression for the protein steady state in terms of the kinetic parameters. We see that the protein steady state depends on the kinetic parameters involved in mRNA dynamics, as well as the kinetic parameters involved in protein dynamics. This is due to the fact that the protein dynamics depend on the mRNA dynamics. This is where the coupling between their dynamics takes place. Moreover, we can see that again, the way that the kinetic parameters show up in the steady state intuitively makes sense. As production rates increase, the steady state increases. As decay rates decrease, the steady state decreases. And so summarizing, we can write the steady state in vector form as is shown here. And mathematically, the state vector will asymptotically approach this steady state. In other words, the limit as t goes to infinity of the, steady sta of the state vector is equal to the steady state vector. This notion is true of any dynamical system where each component of the system is subject to 
production and decay. And additional, an additional requirement is that the steady state condition that is setting all of the time derivatives to zero doesn't lead to an algebraic contradiction. In general, this will be a given for systems without feedback, but the existence of a fixed point may depend critically on parameter values in systems with feedback. I now just want to discuss some experimental considerations. Namely, obviously experiments occur in finite time. In light of this, you may be questioning the relevance of fixed points, since I just said that they're asymptotically approached in the limit that t goes to infinity. The reality is, is that many systems become very close to fixed points on relatively small timescales. This is true in biology more generally. For example, picture a damped pendulum. You can watch such a, a, a damped pendulum reach its stable equilibrium, which is a vertical orientation, in reasonably small timescales. Obviously, this isn't biologically relevant. I just wanted to give an example of an intuitive physical system to think about, for which this statement is true. Moreover, the observed transient will be indistinguishable from the steady state within measurement error after an amount of time. You can explicitly calculate or numerically estimate times required to begin be within a given error of your steady state if this is required for a given initial condition. Moreover, the steady state hypothesis can be verified experimentally. So theoretical predictions, which are conditioned on the steady state assumption, may be experimentally relevant. It's natural to now ask what the stability of this unique fixed point is. When calculating fixed points, you should always perform a stability analysis. Recall we developed the linearized stability analysis in module one. For notational simplicity and clarity, let's define the functions below V1 and V2. V1, which is a function of protein and mRNA concentration, is equal to alpha minus beta sub m times m and V2, which is also a function of both mRNA and protein concentration, is equal to gamma m minus beta sub p, p. Now, using the fact that dm by dt exactly takes the form which we define v, v, v sub 1 as, we can set it equal to v sub 1 at mp. And a similar thing is true for dp by dt being equal to v sub 2 at mp. Using these definitions, we can write the system in the standard form, where we have a state vector x whose derivative by t, t is equal to a vector function v evaluated at the state vector x, where, of course, the vector function v has components v1 and v2, and the state vector x has components which are the mRNA concentration and the protein concentration. Now recall the definition of the Jacobian, which I've shown below. We now compute the partial derivatives so that we can fill in the elements of the Jacobian. Note the notation I've used for partial derivatives with the curly delta and a subscript refers to taking the partial derivative of whatever is in front of it with respect to the variable in the subscript. These are fairly easy derivatives to compute. Now plugging in the calculated derivatives into the Jacobian, we have the form here below, and we see that it doesn't depend on the value of m or p. We can now compute the characteristic polynomial of the Jacobian to find its eigenvalues. Note that in general, the Jacobian would depend on the steady state values, and we need to plug these in first. But as I noticed previously, it turns out that this Jacobian doesn't depend on the value of m and p, so that step is not required. In the case of multiple fixed points, the fixed points may, and in general will, have different stabilities, so you will need to perform the stability analysis for each of the fixed points, which involves calculating the eigenvalues of the Jacobian evaluated at the different fixed points. Now, in taking the determinant of the Jacobian minus the number lambda times the identity matrix, we end up with the polynomial that's shown here, and we set it equal to zero. 
It's a quadratic polynomial in lambda. Solving for lambda gives our eigenvalues. In particular, we see our two eigenvalues are negative beta sub m and negative beta sub p. Since both of these parameters represent rates, they must be positive, and therefore the eigenvalues are both negative. And this is just what I've written here on this slide. This tells us that the steady state that we've calculated is a stable fixed point regardless of parameter values. Now recall the phase portrait we generated for this system of equations with all the parameters set to 1 in the first module. I've shown it here again to remind you. We noted in the first module that we saw a steady state value at x, y equals to 1, 1. Also note that x is m in this case and y is p in this case. Now if we plug in the parameter values all set to 1, in the expressions for the steady state mRNA and protein concentrations, we see indeed we get out the steady state is equal to 1, 1. Moreover, we just calculated that this is a stable fixed point. Therefore, our findings are consistent with the phase portrait. This is part two of the second dry lab module for the Intro Synthetic Biology online series from CSBerg. In this second part of the second module, we're going to look at deterministic modeling of regulated gene expression. This slide is going to motivate why gene expression is regulated in many cases, and one reason for that is that the cytosol is a dynamic environment and requires different abundances or concentrations of many biomolecules at different times. For example, if there is an external stimulus from the cell, which the cell can sense, it may need to turn on certain genes to respond to that stimulus. Um, for example, if it was a toxin and it might need to protect itself from that toxin with some response, or if it's a nutrient that it may need to initiate metabolic pathways to digest that nutrient. Many cellular processes depend on others as well, and the constituents of interdependent cellular processes may have their expression co-regulated or regulate each other's expression, either indirectly or directly. Gene expression may be regulated at various different stages. Some common examples include the following. At the stage of RNA polymerase binding, mRNA elongation, translation and translation initiation, or protein elongation. As well, small RNAs such as microRNAs can play a role in genetic regulation by complexing with the mRNA, thereby preventing translation. We're going to focus specifically on regulation at the level of transcription initiation, which refers to the process of RNA polymerase binding the sequence of DNA. Gene regulation at the level of transcription initiation takes place primarily by the action of transcription factors. In fact, transcription factors are the dominant form of gene regulation in many organisms overall, and they are themselves proteins they can be the same or different than the protein that is eventually translated from the gene that they regulate. Transcription factors bind what are called operator regions of the DNA sequence, and RNA polymerase binds what are called promoter regions of the gene. These operator regions are typically close to the promoter region of the gene they regulate, such that the transcription factor can interact with the RNA polymerase in some way. And here I've shown a cartoon diagram of the transcription factors, which are depicted in purple, binding a sequence of DNA right before the yellow promoter region. Um, this sequence right before the promoter region, of course, would be the operator region. And then downstream, we see the RNA polymerase um, executing the transcription and, and churning out the RNA sequence in red. There are two broad classes of transcription factors. The first class that I'll introduce are transcriptional activators. These are transcription factors which increase the binding affinity of RNA polymerase for the affected gene when the transcription factor is bound to the operator region. As a result, these transcription factors increase the rate of transcription of the affected gene. And here in the figure, I've shown two different ways in which transcriptional activators can increase the binding affinity for RNA polymerase. In panel A at the top, we see activation over a short distance. This is called recruiting. And essentially what happens is that the yellow or the green activator binds the operator region 
and the RNA polymerase has a high affinity for that transcription factor, and so it's pulled close to the promoter region and can more easily bind and initiate transcription on the DNA sequence. In panel B, we see activation over a large distance. This is often called enhancer action. And in this case, the transcription factor, um, due to its favorable interaction with the RNA polymerase, which has to already be bound at the promoter, changed the conformation of the DNA strand in three-dimensional three space, such that transcription initiation can occur. The other broad class of transcription factors are transcriptional repressors. These block RNA polymerase from binding, thereby reducing the binding affinity at the promoter of the affected gene. As a result, the rate of transcription of that gene is decreased. And here I've shown a cartoon example of the LACI gene, which is a, tra which is a transcriptional repressor for LAC. Um, the repressor binds the operator and blocks the transcription on the LAC operon. Really, this is just due to the fact that this is a protein that's bound and literally blocks the, the spatial um, location in which the RNA polymerase needs to come onto the, the DNA sequence at the promoter. Okay, now we'll move on to our Jupyter Notebook Chalk Talk session, where we'll develop a modeling framework for modeling gene expression that is regulated with transcription factors. We now turn our attention to regulated gene expression. And recall, we are going to focus specifically on transcription factors, as I mentioned in the introductory slide presentation. Here, I've included a figure from Brian Engel's textbook to remind us how transcription factors work. In panel A, we see unregulated expression, where the RNA polymerase has a reasonable affinity for the promoter region and is able to come in and execute transcription without any transcription factors. In panel B, we see the case where the transcription factor is a transcriptional repressor. If the transcription factor is absent, shown at the top, then the RNA polymerase is able to come in and bind the high affinity promoter and execute transcription. In contrast, if the repressor is present on the operator region, then the, the RNA polymerase is blocked from binding the promoter region and therefore cannot carry out the mechanism of transcription. In panel C, we see the effect of a transcriptional activator. In the top, where the transcriptional activator is absent, there's no transcription because of a low affinity promoter region. The activator is present, however, transcription is able to proceed because of the high affinity of the RNA polymerase for the activator found at the operator region. The activator will therefore bring the RNA polymerase closer to the promoter region so that it's able to associate and carry out transcription. We'll now develop a, mo a model of transcription factor binding. Let O denote the unbound operator, P the transcription factor, and OP the transcription factor operator complex. The binding unbinding process is described in the following representation. K on denotes the forward rate where the operator associates with the transcription factor and K off represents the reverse rate where the transcription factor and the operator dissociate. The transcription factor binding unbinding occurs on much faster timescales than gene expression itself. So we can treat this process in equilibrium. When there's a timescale separation between two dynamical processes, it's common to treat the faster process in equilibrium to simplify the analysis. This is referred to as a quasi steady state approximation. Recall, we did something similar to this in the early steps of developing the michaelis menten rate law. At equilibrium, we have the k-on times the operator concentration times the transcription factor concentration is equal to k-off times the concentration of the operator transcription factor complex. This follows by setting the forward and reverse rates of the reaction equal to each other. This is exactly the equilibrium condition. Now we can rearrange by dividing both sides of this equation by k on and defining a new parameter capital K equals to k off over k on. Then we can write that the operator transcription factor complex concentration is equal to the product of the operator concentration and the 
transcription factor concentration divided by this new parameter, capital K. This parameter has units of concentration. Since K on has to have units of time inverse over concentration, so that the total forward rate has units of concentration times time inverse, whereas K off has to have units of just time inverse for the same reason. This parameter capital K is often called the dissociation constant. Let F denote the fraction of bound operators. That is the ratio of the operator transcription factor concentration to the total concentration of operators, that is, the sum of the operator transcription factor concentration plus the unbound operator concentration. Using the equilibrium relation that we just discussed, we may substitute it and obtain the expression for F shown here, which results in F equals to the concentration of transcription factor divided by the dissociation constant plus the transcription factor concentration. The effect of a transcription factor will be proportional to this bound fraction. If a transcription factor is an activator, the rate of trans activated transcription is equal to alpha times f, where alpha is some rate parameter giving the appropriate units. Note that the maximal transcription rate, which is given by alpha, is achieved only in the limit that the transcription factor concentration goes to infinity. This is therefore a saturating rate function. If a transcription factor is a repressor, the rate of repressible transcription is equal to some alpha times 1 minus f. This is equal to alpha times k over k plus the concentration of p, where alpha greater than 0 is the maximal transcription rate and is achieved in this case only in the limit that the concentration of transcription factor goes to 0. Note that if f is the fraction of bound operators, 1 minus f is the fraction of unbound operators. This justifies this rate law for the rate of repressible transcription. Typically, genes have some non-zero basal rate of expression, even when the activator is not bound. This is due to the fact that the RNA polymerase will still have some affinity for the promoter, even if it is a low affinity promoter, without the help of the transcriptional activator. Similarly, there's a typically a basal rate associated with repressible genes, even when the repressor is not bound. This is due to the fact that the RNA polymerase will still have some affinity for the promoter, and that there's therefore a non-zero probability that it will associate with the promoter despite the presence of the repressor. Denoting the basal rate as alpha subscript basal, the rate of activated transcription is therefore equal to alpha subscript basal plus the rate law for activated transcription we wrote in the preceding slide. And the rate of repressible transcription is similarly equal to alpha subscript basal plus the rate law for repressible transcription that we wrote on the previous slide. This is all we need to do to formulate a kinetic model of transcription factor regulated gene expression in the case of genes with single operator sites and only one distinct transcription factor. However, promoters can have multiple operator sites and multiple transcription factors leading to more complex regulatory schemes. We will now consider several such cases. Consider the case of two distinct operator regions that bind two different transcription factors. Denote one of these transcription factors as A, and say that it binds operator O subscript A, and we'll denote the other transcription factor as B, and say that it binds operator O subscript B. The promoter then has four states. First state, we'll denote O, and let it be the state where both A and B are unbound from the respective operators. The second state, OA, will be the state where A is bound at operator O sub A, and B is unbound. The third state, O sub B, is the state where B is bound at its operator, O sub B, and A is unbound. And the fourth and final state is O A B, where both A and B are bound at the respective operators.
If binding at operator A and operator B are independent, then the following four reactions define the transcription factor binding unbinding processes. These are similar to the single reaction we wrote down for the single transcription factor case before. By treating each of the four reactions in equilibrium and using the resulting equilibrium relations to express the fractions for each state in terms of the concentration of A and the concentration of B, one obtains the following four expressions for the fraction of each respective state. It would be a good exercise, if you wished, to actually derive these. It's a very similar process as we used in the single transcription factor case, but the algebra just becomes a bit more arduous. Note that we've defined the variable capital K subscript A as the dissociation rate D sub A divided by the association rate A sub A. These are the rate constants for the equilibrium reaction for the association of transcription factor A with its operator. We have a similar definition for capital K subscript B in terms of the rates for the association and disassociation of transcription factor B to its operator. These variables K sub A and K sub B are the dissociation constants for the transcription factor binding processes. These expressions for the fraction in each of the four states can be used to construct rate laws similar to how we use the fraction of the single bound state in the one transcription factor case to formulate rate laws for repressible and activated transcription. However, how you construct the rate laws will depend on exactly what type of transcription factors A and B are. Now we've considered multiple independent transcription factors. However, the binding of a transcription factor may affect the binding affinity of one or more transcription factors on different operators of the same promoter. This is referred to as cooperativity. As before, consider the case of two transcription factors A and B, which bind distinct operators O sub A and O sub B. This time, we'll suppose that the binding of one transcription factor to its operator decreases the dissociation rate of the other transcription factor to its own operator by a factor of k quap. This parameter is less than one. This is an example of po positive cooperativity. Since the dissociation constants dA and dB go to k quap times dA and k quap times dB respectively, which are both less than dA and dB, respectively, the dissociation constants become k quap times ka and k quap times kb. These are each less than ka and kb, respectively. By treating the four reactions that we considered in the previous case with their dissociation constants modified by the cooperativity parameter, we can follow a similar process where we treat each of the four reactions in equilibrium to define the fraction in each state as shown here. Again, how to construct rate laws from these fractions will depend exactly on the nature of the transcription factors A and B, namely whether they are tra transcriptional repressors or transcriptional activators, and they need not be the same type of transcription factor, which complicates matters more. If the cooperativity is sufficiently strong, then the states OA and OB will become negligible since the binding of one transcription factor will always, al almost always induce the binding of the other. Mathematically, this corresponds to the cooperativity parameter being much less than one. And thus, we can make the approximation shown here. The equilibrium fractions under this strong cooperativity approximation are then shown below. There is only the state O and the state OAB. If the cooperative transcription factors are unique, then we're done. 
we, we may use the OAB fraction to formulate a rate law, as we did in the case of a single transcription factor. Now, when we consider cooperative transcription factors, it doesn't really make sense to consider them being different types of transcription factors. Typically, when transcription factors exhibit cooperativity, they are either both transcriptional activators or transcriptional repressors. Now I ask, what if the cooperative transcription factors are the same? We will now consider such a case. Suppose the transcription factors are identical, that is A is the same as B, and we'll define that as P. And the equilibrium fractions, by just substituting this in, become what is shown here. Note I've defined K tilde as the cooperativity parameter times the dissociation constant for A times the dissociation constant for B. The general form of the promoter occupancy, i.e. the fraction of in the bound state, in the case of n identical transcription factors with strong cooperativity, is shown below. The parameter k is the half-saturating concentration. A function of this form, f of p equals p to the n over k plus p to the n, is called a Hill function, and n is the Hill coefficient. Sometimes this is also referred to as the Hill-Langmuir equation and was developed in 1910 to describe the saturating O2 binding curve of hemoglobin and is rather prevalent in biochemical modeling. Often, if the mechanism of ligand binding is unknown, a Hill function can be used as an empirical fit function in the development of models. This is part three of the second dry lab module for the Intro Synthetic Biology online series from CSBIRD. In this third part of the second module on deterministic modeling of genetic circuits, we're going to look at the Collins toggle switch, which is a particular example of a synthetic gene circuit. The Collins toggle switch was introduced in the seminal paper from Gardner et al. called Construction of a Genetic Toggle Switch in E. coli, and it was published in Nature in 2000. In this paper, the authors endeavored to realize a genetic toggle switch by rewiring existing gene regulatory networks in E. coli. Before I talk about the Collins toggle switch specifically, I'll introduce the notion of biostability from dynamical systems theory. Biostability is a fundamental requirement for a toggle switch in general, and it refers to the existence of two stable fixed points in the underlying dynamics. I've included this figure of a potential energy landscape as a function of a spatial variable x to, to convey the notion of biostability. Here, we see two stable fixed points, one x1 and x2. We know they're stable, since if the value of x near either of these points is perturbed slightly, it will move down the potential energy landscape to the stable minima. Alternatively, x3 is an unstable fixed point, since if the value of x near x3 was perturbed to either side, it would roll down the hill to either x1 or x2. You can think about this simple um, depiction as balls rolling on a hill. This notion generalizes to higher dimensional spaces as well. This is, of course, an example of a one-dimensional dynamical system, but it's pretty clear how you can generalize this. Another requirement of a toggle switch is that there's a means to actually switch the switch. So in this case, the experimental synthetic biologist needs to be able to do something to the system such that this, the genetic toggle switch switches from some state to another state. The experimenter for the Collins toggle switch may switch between toggle states by adding a chemical stimulus called an inducer. An inducer does one of the following two things. It either binds activators to increase operator binding affinity or it disables repressors, and I folded this because this is the type of inducer we care about for the Collins toggle switch. Now that we've defined the requirements for a toggle switch in general, we can talk specifically about the Collins toggle switch. I've included this figure from page 207 of Brian Engel's textbook, which represents the schematic of the gene circuit which defines the Collins toggle switch. On the left, we see gene 1 which has a gene product of repressor 1, 
This is a protein and is a transcriptional repressor for gene 2. Gene 2, on the other hand, gets translated eventually to repressor 2, which is a transcriptional repressor for gene 1. We also see inducer 1 inhibits the inhibition of gene 2 by repressor 1. Similarly, inducer 2 inhibits the inhibition of gene 1 by repressor 2. We would call gene 1 and gene 2 mutually inhibitory because they each inhibit each other's transcription. The idea behind the toggle switch is that the presence of inducer 2 turns off the repression of gene 1 by gene 2, thereby increasing the concentration of gene 1. We define the state 1 of the Collins toggle switch as the state where gene 1 is high and gene 2 is low. And what we mean by that is that repressor 1 is high and repressor 2 is low. Those are the resulting proteins from each of these respective genes. Since the system is symmetric, it makes sense then that the opposite is true. That is, inducer 1 implies that the repression of gene 2 by gene 1 is disabled, and therefore we see an increase in the concentration of gene 2. And we'll define state 2 as the state where gene 2 is high and gene 1 is low. On this slide, I just want to motivate why the Collins toggle switch was so important, especially in the realm of synthetic biology. From the experimental side of things, it was one of the earliest realizations of a synthetic gene circuit in vivo. 2000 was really, one might say, the birth of synthetic biology. From a modeling perspective, it's an ex excellent example of the use of models to guide the development of and progress of experimental efforts. This is a key aspect of systems biology and synthetic biology. And some points on this front are the following. Not just any two mutually repressing genes will exhibit bistability. How to select genes from a library of characterized E. coli genes to form a bistable switch was one question that was answered by the modeling efforts. A model was not simply fit to some data, but rather what they were able to produce, namely a working engineered genetic toggle switch, was achievable because of insight gained from theoretical models. So this is the difference between descriptive and a mechanistic model. Here, a mechanistic model was developed and informed the experimental pro progress and resulted in a working engineered genetic circuit. Alternatively, the descriptive model would mean just building something and then fitting a model to it. And doing so, it's not so clear they would have even achieved their goal of a working synthetic gene circuit without the insights provided by a mechanistic model. Okay. Now that we have our introduction on the Collins toggle switch, we can develop a model of it and talk about some of the analyses that were performed in the paper, including a bifurcation analysis and a phase plane analysis. We will do this with our Jupyter Notebook talk, Chalk Talk session. We'll now shift our attention to modeling of the Collins toggle switch. Recall the toggle, Collins toggle switch is the gene circuit depicted in the following interaction diagram. We have gene 1, which eventually codes for a repressor called repressor 1. Repressor 1 is a transcriptional repressor for gene 2. Gene 2 encodes for another repressor, which we'll call repressor 2. And repressor 2 is in turn a transcriptional repressor for gene 1. Therefore, gene 1 and gene 2 are what we would call mutually inhibitory genes. Additionally, we see that there are two inducers involved, inducer 1, which inhibits the inhibition of gene 2 by repressor 1, and inducer 2, which inhibits the inhibition of gene 1 by repressor 2. Our goal is to formulate a simple model of a mutually repressing gene network subject to inducer effects, such as this one. We then wish to use this model to understand how to pick genes such that the network exhibits behavior such as that depicted in the figure here. In particular, we wanted to be able to switch between two stable states, that is, exhibit bistability. The dashed line in this figure 
represents the concentration of repressor 2, where the solid line represents the concentration of repressor 1. The figure shows that inducer 2 acts as a switch to switch from the state where repressor 2 is high to the state where repressor 1 is high. This happens due to the fact that inducer 2 inhibits the repression of gene 1 by repressor 2. A similar effect is observed for inducer 1, switching from the high repressor 1 state to the high repressor 2 state. Note that the states are persistent even after the inducer is inactive. To develop a model for the Collins toggle switch, let us start off by considering the two repressors with concentrations denoted P1 and P2, respectively. We'll denote the concentrations of the corresponding mRNA transcripts as M1 and M2, respectively. Further, suppose that P1 is a transcriptional repressor for M2, and P2, in turn, is a transcriptional repressor for M1. This encodes the mutual inhibition. We have all the tools that we need to formulate a deterministic kinetic model of this gene network. Using these tools, I write down the following system of equations that represents a model for this gene network. We use a Hill function to represent the transcription rate for both the mRNA species. Note that the Hill function for the transcription of M1 depends on the repressor concentration P2. And the Hill function for the transcription of M2 depends on the repressor concentration P1. Again, this is the mutual inhibition. Further, note that as per usual, we assume linear decay for all of the species. And for translation, we consider the rate to take place proportional to the corresponding mRNA transcript for the protein. This model assumes negligible degradation of both protein and mRNA species, such that the concentration flux out of the system, or decay, is attributed to dilution due to cell growth and division. This justifies using a single decay parameter beta for both mRNAs and both proteins. The model further assumes that the dissociation constants and cooperativity parameters for both protein 1 and protein 2 are approximately the same. This justifies using the same half saturation constant k for the Hill functions. Following the authors of the original Collins toggle switch paper, We'll build our model neglecting mRNA dynamics. This means we'll treat the mRNA under a quasi-steady state approximation so that the mRNA concentration is a function of protein concentration. This is justified since the mRNA dynamics in biology are often much faster than protein dynamics. Regardless, this model doesn't need to capture every little detail. It needs to just be useful in order to guide the experiments. To reduce the number of parameters to reflect the true number of degrees of freedom of parameter space, we non-dimensionalize the system. This is a common procedure in analyzing dynamical systems as it reduces the number of parameters that one needs to consider the effect of on the final dynamics. The above system of equations is equivalent to what I've written here, where we have dp sub i by dt is equal to alpha sub i times the repressing Hill function, which depends on P sub J, minus beta times P sub I, where I is not equal to J, and both can take values of one or two. I write the two-dimensional system this way so, so that when I do the non-dimensionalization procedure, I can just perform the operations on one equation instead of performing the exact same operations on two equations that are identical up to a perturbation in their, in their indices. We may first rescale the equation by beta. We do this by dividing both sides by the parameter beta. The result of that is shown below. And then we redefine time as the unitless parameter tau defined as t divided by beta. Then we can write the dp sub i by dt is equal to alpha sub i over beta times the repressing Hill function of p sub j minus p sub i. Then in the second equals sign on the right, I have divided 
the top and the bottom of the Hill function by k. I now define the new variable p sub i tilde as p sub i divided by k, and similarly we define p sub j tilde as p sub j divided by k. Then we can write the p sub i tilde by d tau, which is equivalent to 1 over k times dpi by d tau is equal to alpha sub i over beta k times 1 over 1 plus p sub j over k to the power of n sub j. But p sub j over k is exactly p sub j tilde. And then we also have minus p sub i over k. But p sub i over k is exactly p sub i tilde. Now I've substituted the p sub j tilde and the p sub i tilde in on the right. Now we define another unitless parameter, mu sub i, which is equal to alpha sub i over beta times k. This results in the final non-dimensionalized form of the equation, which is dp sub i tilde by dt is equal to mu sub i times 1 over 1 plus p sub j tilde to the power of n sub j minus p sub i tilde. Or more transparently, writing both equations out explicitly, this is the resulting non-dimensionalized form of the system. The benefit of this is that we re reduce the number of parameters from six in total to four in total. The four parameters now being u sub one and u sub two, and n sub two and n sub one. This greatly simplifies our analysis of the model. We now need to incorporate the effects of the inducers. Recall that inducer I inhibits the inhibitory effect of protein I on the transcription of mRNA J, which directly corresponds to synthesis of protein J under the quasi steady state approximation. Let I sub 1 and I sub 2 be dimensionless proxies for the concentrations of inducers 1 and 2, respectively. These are analogous to the p sub 1 tilde and the p sub 2 tilde as, that we defined as dimensionless proxies for the protein concentrations. We can incorporate the effects of the inducers as is shown here. The division of the protein concentrations by the inducers that affect them corresponds to a the effects of the inducers can be incorporated into our model as is shown here. How we've incorporated the inducers can be understood intuitively by considering the equation for dp sub 1 tilde by dt. We'll just consider this equation since again, the two equations are identical up to a permutation in their indices. We see in the dynamical equation for p sub 1 tilde that p sub 2 tilde in the Hill function has been divided by 1 plus i2. In doing so, we see that if i2 increases, since the ratio of p sub 2 tilde divided by 1 plus i2 will decrease then, the Hill function increases when the inducer concentration increases. This means that the inducer has the required effect of inhibiting the inhibition of production of repressor 1 by repressor 2. Moreover, we see that if I sub 2 is 0, then the inhibition by repressor 2 of repressor 1 production is completely unaffected. This is also a requirement of the model. Now that we've developed the model, we will discuss what can be observed from such a model and the relevance that this model had to experimental development in the Collins toggle switch paper. Shown here in the figure borrowed from Brian Ingall's textbook, we see an exemplary phase portrait in the uninduced bistable parameter regime and the effect of the inducer on the phase space flow. So in panel A, we have the concentration of repressor 2 on the y-axis and the concentration of repressor 1 on the x-axis. And the phase portrait 
exhibits biostability. In the lower right corner, we have the high repressor 1 and low repressor 2 state. And in the top left corner, we have the other state where repressor 2 is high and repressor 1 is low. These are both stable states. This can be seen by the fact that the flow tends towards these states. And then one can also notice that there is an unstable fixed point denoted by the white square in between them. The black and gray lines shown on the phase portrait represent what are called null clines. The null cline are the set of points for which the dynamical equation is equal to zero. For example, the black line is the null cline for repressor one. So all points along this line represent concentrations for repressor two and repressor one for which the derivative of the concentration of repressor one with respect to time is equal to zero. The null cline for repressor two, the gray line, therefore represents the set of points for which the derivative of repressor two concentration with respect to time is equal to zero. Note that the intersection of the null clines gives the fixed points. This makes sense because this is exactly how we solve for fixed points. We set both of the dynamical equations equal to zero simultaneously. In panel B, we see the phase portrait that arises under the influence of inducer 2. See the null cline for repressor 1 has shifted and that there's a single steady state. The single steady state represents the state for the system where repressor 1 is high and repressor 2 is low. All trajectories converge to this unique stable fixed point. As I've previously mentioned, in general, the existence and stability of fixed points in a dynamical system depend on parameter values. In other words, the parameter values can have non trivial qualitative effects on the phase space flow of the system and therefore have effects on the nature of solutions. The term bifurcation roughly refers to such qualitative change in the phase portrait of the system for a particular combination of parameter values. We're interested in performing bifurcation analysis of the Collins toggle switch model because bistability is not guaranteed for any mutually repressing genes. And as the Collins toggle switch paper authors wanted to understand, we want to understand how to pick genes in order to achieve bistability. This is equivalent to asking the question, what parameter regimes give rise to bistability? Bifurcation analyses are typically rather cumbersome, and typically one will turn to computation to study bifurcation structures of the model as a result. The authors of the Collins toggle switch paper did exactly this in order to study the bifurcation structure of the toggle switch model. The figure that I'll show on the next slide is borrowed from Brian Ingall's textbook and is an adaptation of the figure shown in the Collins toggle switch paper that details the bifurcation structure of the toggle switch model. Before we analyze this figure, I just wanted to note some notational differences between us and Brian Ingalls. The beta shown in the figure is equivalent to the Hill coefficient n sub 2 in our notation, and the gamma shown in the figure is equivalent to the Hill coefficient n sub 1 in our notation. Moreover, the figure assumes that n sub 1 and n sub 2 are equal. Additionally, a notational difference is that the alpha sub i's depicted in the figure above are equivalent to our mu sub i's. So you can consider the x-axis of the figure to be the natural logarithm of mu sub 2 and the y-axis to be the natural logarithm of mu sub 1. This figure tells us a couple of things. One thing it tells us is that for low cooperativity, so that is n sub 1 equal n sub 2 small, bistability can only be achieved with approximately equal promoter strengths. This can be seen by the fact that as the, as the cooperativity decreases, the two lines that define the bistable regime become closer and closer together, and in the limit that the Hill coefficients both go to zero, that line would converge to the line of unit slope. 
a line of unit slope reflects the parameter regime where the promoter strengths are equal. Mu sub 1 and mu sub 2 are proxies for promoter strength as they reflect the maximum rate of production of the proteins. Moreover, the cooperativity sets an increasing upper bound on the amount of imbalance between promoter strengths allowed before the system bifurcates from bistability to monostability. That is, as the promoter strength increases more and more, you're allowed a greater and greater imbalance between mu sub 1 and mu sub 2. We can summarize what we've learned from the bifurcation structure figure in the following way. If you want to build a genetic toggle switch with repressors exhibiting low cooperativity, you must have well-balanced promoters. If you want to build a genetic toggle switch with imbalanced promoters, you must pick highly cooperative repressors. As you'll see if you read the Collins toggle switch paper, these insights gained from modeling truly did inform the selection of genes to implement a working genetic toggle switch in living E. coli cells, which is wonderful. It really highlights that modeling does play a large role in synthetic biology and can have real impacts on experimental developments. This should really be the goal of modelers in the realm of synthetic biology. This concludes our discussion of deterministic modeling of genetic circuits, and I will now summarize what we've covered. Following this summary, I will briefly introduce stochasticity in biology. We started off discussing deterministic modeling of genetic circuits. In this discussion, we started off with unregulated gene expression, where we developed a dynamical model and we found the fixed point and classified its stability. Then we moved on to regulated gene expression, where we focused on transcription factors, talked about the dynamics of transcription factors and developed rate laws for single transcription factors, two distinct transcription factors, and then we talked about cooperativity for two distinct and two identical transcription factors. And then we discussed Hill functions as a general formulation of rate laws for cooperative transcription factors. Then we moved on to discuss a specific example of a synthetic gene circuit, particularly the Collins toggle switch. Here we developed a model. We used the quasi steady state approximation to eliminate the MRI mRNA dynamics, and we non-dimensionalized the system to make it easier to study the effects of parameters on our resulting dynamics. In analyzing the model that we developed, we looked at the phase plane in the bistable regime, studied the bifurcation structure, and then discussed model-driven experimentation. This is part four of the second dry lab module for the Intro to Synthetic Biology online series from CSBIRD. While the title here says deterministic modeling of genetic circuits, it's somewhat false advertising for, for part four, as this part is going to give an introduction and motivation of stochastic modeling of genetic circuits. This will allow us to transition nicely in the module three, where I'll focus on the technical details of stochastic modeling. I will now introduce the notion of stochasticity in biology. So far, we have considered strictly deterministic models of chemical reaction networks. What this refers to is modeling continuous changes in concentration over time using ordinary differential equations. These types of models are deterministic in the sense that these differential equations can be solved to exactly obtain a formula for the time evolution of our concentrations. However, Chemical reactions are fundamentally the result of collisions of individual molecules. This is true whether we're talking about chemistry inside of a test tube or inside of a biological cell. Only rarely will these molecular collisions be energetic enough to overcome free energy barriers. This is the case because the energy of these collisions depends on several physical variables. This includes the trajectories at which the molecules collide, as well as their orientations with respect to each other. This is especially true for macromolecules such as proteins, where the collision may need to take place such that an active site can associate with the other molecule for the reaction to proceed. The energy of these molecular collisions also depends on other physical variables such as velocity of the individual molecules. 
Since these collisions only rarely will result in reactions from proceeding, the reactions are therefore unpredictable. You may naturally ask then, when are deterministic models appropriate? We spent all this time developing a deterministic modeling framework for chemical reaction networks, and now I'm telling you that they're inherently stochastic. Well, it turns out that biochemical systems with a large number of molecules may be amenable to deterministic modeling. And in fact, in many settings, deterministic models are employed. This is due to the fact that in general, stochastic networks with large numbers, the randomness associated with individual interactions may be averaged out. And I've included this figure from page 236 of Ingall's textbook to demonstrate this. This figure shows the results of stochastic simulations for consecutive decay for three different initial numbers of molecules. Now I'll just remind you what consecutive decay refers to. It refers to a, an initial abundance of molecules decaying at a rate proportional to their own abundance. In a deterministic model, this would correspond to a concentration, assuming a fixed volume, that decays exponentially. In panel A, where the stochastic simulation starts off with a thousand molecules, we see a relatively smooth looking curve uh, that pretty well approximates a decaying exponential. In panel B, where we start with 100 molecules, we start to see a little more stochastic fluctuations amongst that exponential decay. And in panel C, where the stochastic simulation starts with only 10 molecules, the stochastic effects are very much evident. This is meant to highlight the fact that when large numbers are present, the deterministic models do a pretty good job at modeling the average behavior. It's worth noting that stochasticity is not always bad. It's easy to think of stochasticity as a bad thing that biology has to overcome. I mean, it's essentially synonymous with noise, so that's a pretty reasonable thing to think. However, biology can use the inherent stochasticity of its underlying chemistry to its benefit in some cases. One example of this is what's called bacterial persist persistence, and this refers to a population of isogenic, which means genetically identical, bacteria that stochastically give rise to a small subpopulation of cells that are persistent when a colony is treated with antibiotics. That is, the rest of the colony dies off while a few cells don't die. And this, it turns out, is a purely stochastic phenomenon, and of course, is a benefit to that bacterial colony. On the other hand, some biological processes must be, which means are, tightly regulated. A question of fundamental biology that naturally arises then is how have biological networks evolved to mitigate stochastic fluctuations in such pro processes that are observed to be tightly regulated? And another question that's related, but more a question of engineering biology, is how can we engineer biological networks to achieve these desirable control objectives? Answering this question can both inform how to proceed answering the question of fundamental biology, but also can be useful for us to actually engineer and implement synthetic networks that can have useful applications. Some questions you might ask in particular here are what network topologies can achieve noise attenuation for a gene of interest? What network topologies allow for adaptation in the output of a gene of interest? How can we realize these in living cells or in vivo? These are questions that are really at the forefront of synthetic biology research or some subset of synthetic biology research at least. Stochastic noise can be broken up into two main sources. The first source of stochastic noise, which I'll talk about, is intrinsic noise. This refers to the noise inherent to the individual biochemical reactions which take place in the system. On the other hand, there's extrinsic noise. This is the noise which affects all processes in the cell, or at least a relevant defined subset of these processes. Examples include ribosome availability or abundance. This, of course, affects all translation processes in the cell equally. The intrinsic noise associated with translation processes would be the noise associated with the chemical reactions that take place between the messenger RNA and the translation machinery, such as the ribosome. Another example of extrinsic noise is temperature fluctuations. This will affect the kinetic parameters. I've included this figure from Michael Alowitz's paper published in Science in 2002. This paper is on stochastic gene expression in bacteria. 
In panel A at the top here, we can see a time trace of the fluorescence of a fluorescently labeled gene. This shows two different genes, red and green, uh, being highly correlated over time. This is meant to illustrate the uh, expected time traces in the absence of intrinsic noise. And this would result in set yellow cells due to the mixed red and green signal in equal proportions at all times. On the other hand, in panel B, we see an example of what your time trace for fluorescence might look like if there were sources of intrinsic noise. What you see in particular is that the red and green traces are not correlated in time, not perfectly correlated in time, I should say. This results in a population of cells that has varying different varying colors of fluorescence, ranging from almost purely green to almost purely red, and shades of yellow and orange in between. And indeed, this is what they see in the experimental results. This was very early evidence that the stochastic effects of biochemistry are not negligible when studying gene expression in bacteria. That pretty much concludes it for this intro to stochasticity in biology. In module three, we'll look at the technical aspects of stochastic modeling and develop a stochastic modeling framework for biochemical networks.